Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. All right, hello, and I am with uh, Laird Barron, the author of many incredible books uh, in several genres, but most recently the Isaiah Coleridge novels, um, and specifically the recently released Worse Angels, which is um, one of the main reasons why we're going to be talking today, but we're going to talk about all the Isaiah Coleridge books in depth and if you i'm sure there's plenty of interviews out there that are focused on laird's like cosmic horror and all that stuff um and i've heard plenty of those interviews but i want to focus on this trilogy because i haven't heard enough in my opinion about the writing of these incredible books and i will and i wanted to go in deep so laird thank you for joining me on postcards from a dying world and um let's get going <laughs> hey thanks for having me on yeah, so let's talk about um, these books. Did the character come to you first or the setting in the world come to you first? The, uh, the character did. Um, uh, and he sort of, Isaiah Coleridge has is, described him in the past as sort of a synthesis of the tough guy. Uh, it's kind of a string of tough guy characters that I've created over the years. That's you know, in the, in, <clears throat> I've written five novels, uh, four collections, actually almost six collections now worth of material. And one of the string, you know, one of the veins that I've mined over and over again uh, is the tough guy, the hard boiled protagonist. And there just seems to be infinite variety within that very narrow slice of, of literature. Uh, and Coleridge, I feel that he sort of represents my best take on that micro genre uh, that, I, that I'm able to, to, to bring forth at this point. And so he, uh, I decided to try to write a crime novel uh, and, and a straightforward crime novel, you know, not, nothing with the, uh, the supernatural involved. Uh, but I didn't know who my main character was gonna be or what he was going to be. I just knew that he would be hard bitten. I felt comfortable with that, leading with that uh, at novel length. Uh, and he just sort of came to me, uh, as I've said, sort of flippantly, you know, he gave the best audition as I went through kind of like my mental Rolodex uh, and started summoning these, these fictive characters or, or prototypes. He, he was the one who stuck out and really insisted uh, on being written about. Was there anyone, because his uh, origins are similar to yours and being from Alaska, was there anyone from your home state of Alaska who, who like specifically informed Isaiah? Oh, or? yes. Um, and of course, as I, as I, almost every one of my characters uh, is either a, a kind of a composite of people that I've met or people that I've observed. Um, and I changed the names, of course, to protect the guilty. Uh, but he, he actually, elements of his story uh, are, and actually even some of the plot of the first book, uh, Blood Standard, are reflective of reality of things, you know, little bits and pieces of things that actually did occur in Alaska and people that I knew, um, you know, and then of course I embellished the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing people don't realize about writers too is that when you hear about weird and interesting and like uh, fucked up individuals, you, you, you're like, oh wait, tell me about that. <laughs> like, I'd like to hear more about this person. And I'm sure, uh, you mind that pretty heavily for this character as far as like things that you and people you met in Alaska. It seems like it to me anyways. Yeah, uh, you know, in short fiction, uh, especially, well, the stakes are lower. They have a tendency to be lower. You know, you're talking about something that's anywhere from two or 3,000 words to maybe 20 or 30, but it's, you know, certainly, unless it's a giant novella, it's nowhere near the, the labor uh, intensity of, of writing a novel. Uh, and I have a lot of different places they can sell a story if somebody doesn't want it. But the, so, so what, I, what I decided to do is, is I, in that first book, I played it a little bit safer and I allowed some of my uh, past to do the heavy lifting for me. I decided to make it a fish out of water story. 
uh, and then combine that with the fact that I do enjoy and have written extensively about these types of characters. So I just, I, I went to my strength and then I said, you know, I come from Alaska. I had to travel over here. I'm learning the area that I've, so I set the novel in an area that I'm learning and it just made it a lot easier um, for that initial novel. And of course, as, as the series goes on, you know, Coleridge becomes acclimated to his, to his setting. And so it doesn't rely on me at all anymore. But that, that first novel was definitely, um, drew heavily upon my own experiences, but I did it mostly just to make it easy, easier on myself. I, I, uh, this was the first time I'd ever attempted to write a, a long piece of fiction that was not, um, you know, rooted in the supernatural or, 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 or horror. Mm -hmm. Well, in Upstate New York is definitely a character in all mm. three of the books. Yeah. Um, and uh, speaking of somebody, uh, I lived in Syracuse during the 90s. Nice. So I, I know a little bit about Upstate New York. And um, <coughs> so, so I enjoyed that nature of it because I think, you know, a lot of people forget because New York has such a huge, has such a huge gravity story-wise and, and, and setting-wise, even Long Island, but you don't get a lot of stories that are set in that Finger Lakes or that upstate region, some, you know, the Poughkeepsie's, those kinds of right. places. And there's lots of really, um, you know, you can have very liberal places like Ithaca and you can have very rural places That's uh, right. like in, in upstate New York. So, and, and so I'm sure what, you, what you're basically saying is that that moving to this area informed heavily blood standard in particular. It did. And that, and that fish out of water thing. And I, and I think that comes through heavily. And um, I think, how, how did you use that lens to inform Isaiah as a character to show like really who he is in relation to this new place where he was landing? Um, well, it, it, it's, you know, actually the setting is perfect, uh, unlike Alaska. I mean, Alaska has its urban, you know, Anchorage, Alaska is a big city. There's a quarter mm -hmm. of a million people living there. But it's either you're in the city or you're completely in the sticks in Alaska. And of course, it's been 25 years, but I, you know, since I've been there, but I, I grew up there. And the difference between a liberal and a conservative in Alaska was the caliber of handgun. That used to be the joke. The caliber of handgun people carry uh, de defines whether they're a liberal or a conservative. Um, gun control, you know, you use two hands, that kind of a thing. And so there's not a lot of, it could have changed. I'm sure it, it has probably changed to some degree, but Alaska was staunchly, belligerently um, conservative. Uh, it's just conservative and then ultra uh, maniacal uh, conspiracy theory uh, conservative. And so, New York State is actually a, an interesting place to set uh, a character like Coleridge because it it's more uh, it's easier for me to demonstrate his duality or or basically the nuances of his nature because some of the some of these stories within each novel there are there's going to be settings where he's in kind of almost high society uh, mm -hmm. because he he knows how to roll he was trained to roll with that crowd uh, he's not just a goon. But he also spends plenty of time tramping around in the woods, uh, you know, which is also his woodsy nature when he had to do things up uh, in the backwoods in Alaska. So I kind of get to, you know, uh, demonstrate almost the full scope of his of his care, or at least a large scope of his the large scope of his character, just because uh, the nuance here in New uh, in New York State, Washington State was another one. I was there. I, I lived there for like sixteen years, and that was another state where um, it, it's largely a liberal state um but if you if you're not in the huge population centers you could be near a white a supremacist compound um you know out in the country it has a tendency to be a lot more conservative uh but there's like a there's like a suburbia like like i said in alaska there's there, there's not really the same level of suburbia as there as there is uh here and so i really can just if I want the novel to be set in the woods, I can set it in the woods here. Or if I want it to be set in the city, I can set it in the city. And the final point I'd make about it, and probably to my detriment as far as foreign sales go, I, I haven't even touched on New York City much uh, mm -hmm. because that's pretty much where everybody goes. It's what you expect. If you hear a story is set in, a detective York, series yeah. is set in New York, well, you're all oh, obviously hangs out in the city. And I don't think Coleridge is even, except maybe mentioning him going to the airport, has been to 
you know, to, to the city within the confines of any of these books, but it's certainly yeah. something I would do. Well, it might be interesting to see how his character relates to that city. I would say um, one of the things is with, in, in Alaska, a, a character, you, you go to great lengths to really um, display how like ugly and out of place Isaiah is compared to even Alaska <laughs> society. And I think it's easier for him to hide and be unnoticed in, in, in Alaska. And so I think that part of the kind of the charm of Blood Standard is that um, he's having to, I think, be, or, or he's having to deal with that whole fish out of water that I'm being noticed now. I can't hide because I'm this big, scary looking guy that people now notice, you know, a lot more. At least that's what it felt to me. Um, there's, right, absolutely. And there's also, and I try to do, do all this with a light touch. There's, a, the, you know, politics, and uh, the nuance of race relations and things like that do do appear in, in this series, but only in the sense that to tell a, to tell a, an authentic and, and realistic tale or an honest tale, um, you, you can't just elide everything. And so, uh, one of the things that Coleridge is running into uh, is the fact that he's no longer under the aegis of uh, the mafia so it's not necessarily to his advantage to be he's not running with a certain crowd anymore that they all well that's just isaiah they don't look at him like well he's he's not white or he's not one of us uh he's he's part of the mafia and now and obviously alaska even though it, it does have its big population center it's a very small town so to speak or a small state everybody knows especially in his circle everybody would kind of know everybody including the police and now these days he has to worry about you know driving while black essentially he's got to worry about you know being harassed in ways that he never had been you know uh before because he's just another guy now as far as people are concerned yeah and some of the mo some of the better and and just really like powerful moments of um uh of blood sander come from his uh his philosophical thinking about violence. One of one of my favorite scenes in Blood Standard is there's there's a part where he's about to destroy, annihilate a room, <laughs> and he thinks about like this isn't like a John Woo movie. This is this is about to get really ugly, and then it, it kind of ends with him saying, "I think I I I then annihilated the world." <laughs> I just went into it. And I think some of those, that philosophical thinking that, um, that Isaiah has shows a depth to the character that um, not every tough guy character in a book has. And it was one of the things that I think deepened Blood Standard, but it also reminded me that, hey, I'm, I, I am reading a book written by somebody who's well-versed in, 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 in the cosmic <laughs> <laughs> the cosmic fiction world as well. Um, but I, I don't know how much of that was intentional to make uh, Isaiah like a deeper thinker. Where did that come from in his character? Uh, it's something I played with in the past. Um, one of my favorite characters, two of my favorite characters in the tough guy genre that I wrote about. One was um, the son of a mad scientist. And he was actually a like almost like a Frankenstein creation, except through cloning. And uh that character is uh, he uh, his name's navarro he uh and he's an underground underground fighter and everybody thinks that he's he's stupid uh but what, what the reality of it is he just has brain damage he actually is uh smarter than he, he probably probably isn't like a like a quadruple phd level thinker like einsteinian kind of a thinker it's just that he's his brain has been turned into mush uh and then there was another character I wrote about who was a Pinkerton and uh, he'd been raised by a lawyer and so he knew the law. And so I, I actually do have an affinity for the um, more complex roots. Uh, and I think that probably comes from the classics. Uh, you know, like uh, Col Coleridge for me doesn't, isn't a tarnished knight. Uh, he doesn't come from that 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 sector of, of 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 noir or crime or mystery he actually for me reaches much farther back to gilgamesh or um achilles or uh odysseus you know though you know those types of characters um 
where he's almost like a mythic figure, uh, but he doesn't realize it's not, it's not, it's not that he, or Hercules, I guess is the really obvious one. It's not so much that he even really acknowledges that, but he's, he's sort of waking to it as the series goes. And so everything that I've, I've done with him, including starting really softly and, and almost really close to the vest with blood standard and it being such a, uh, I don't want to say by the numbers, but very conventional in its plotting and, and its structure. Uh, and then Black Mountain expands and gets weirder and creepier. And then Worse Angels, we're now full on into supernatural uh, intrusion. And, but also more existential philosophy that actually is coming, putting the screws to the people in the story. That's always been part of the plan. The, the, the plan is, is that Coleridge is sort of a, a, a modern day analogy for Achilles and those guys. And, um, you know, I, and, and so that, that's what a lot of the, the um, uh, I don't even want to say the deep thinking, but the allusions to the classics and things like that, even the quotations from the classics, is I'm, I'm drawing that noose tighter and tighter as to what Coleridge is and what he represents. Right. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about your crime fiction influences, because especially with Blood Standard, I, I mean, I immediately saw some a little bit of the Dashiell Hammetts, the Elmore Leonards, the, yep. you know, like some of those things. And, and because of your connection or, or <coughs> published in, in Cosmic Horror, like immediately a lot of times people will, will connect you to Lovecraft or Ligotti and and some of the some of the other writers that work in that field, and and all respect to them, uh, but I, as somebody who is a crime fiction reader too, like loved seeing like elements of of Dashiell Hammett and uh, Raymond Chandler and Elmore Leonard um, mixing w with the, the the extremely weird stuff. And like the modern, just ultra violence that came with, especially with Blood Standard, like just really like, you know, it read like you were like rubbing your your brain against a rusty edge. And for, I don't know why, but you, these three books, I end up making all kinds of analogies and similes whenever I talk about these books. <laughs> and and I think, but those influences. Uh, like, how did they play a part in in um, informing what you wanted to do here? Well, you know, I love, uh, actually, I don't necessarily love Lovecraft himself, but I really do have gotten a lot of sustenance from his vision. And, our, um, you know, Clark, Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard. I mean, I grew up reading actually very little Lovecraft. Lovecraft didn't come along for me uh, until... I want to say my teens. I mean, I, I know I read some of his stuff when I was a kid, just because, but forgot it. I've forgotten as much stuff as I, uh, you know, as I can remember reading. But because I used to read indiscriminately when I was a kid, you know, we were living out in the woods. We lived in a little cabin and we had crates of books. And so I would just read. I didn't care about who the author was. I just wanted to read whatever I could get my hands on. Uh, but in those days, you know, in my adolescence to my uh, mid-teens to late teens, I was reading a lot of Hammett and Chandler, uh, obviously Leonard, uh, and of course, you know, like the Westerns, like uh, Zane Gray, Max Brand, Louis L'Amour, those were, and then of course all the nameless, you know, the house, the house name, uh, th those 30,000 word, you know, little paperback novels, I'd read like at least one a day of those if they were lying around. And so, and of course, Jack London, and I, it was, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of that. Of course, you mix in Poe, I, I owe a huge, um, uh, debt to Poe or, or, or shake my fist and curse him. But I mean, he has a huge influence on my writing. Uh, and actually for most of my career, an unexamined influence. I didn't realize how much live burial uh, uh, and, and basically, you know, uh, deteriorating sanity played a role in my stories. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, Mr. Poe. I, I, gotta, I gotta lay that on your doorstep. But John D. McDonald, uh, when I was in my teens, I started, or, actually probably adolescence, I started reading John D. MacDonald, um, you know, all those guys. And I really, oh, and of course, uh, a little bit later on, I got into the Spencer series, uh, the Parker's Spencer series, and then of course the Parker series um, by Stark. And so that that's all, 
kind of what I'm made out of. That's all part of my reading, my literary DNA. Uh, and of course, you know, then later on in the 90s, I got into people like uh, Elroy. Uh, Elroy was a revelation, I think, as he was to many. Mm. And so I, I have a lot of contemporary writers that are either influences or people that I really admire. But a, a lot of my sustenance and probably why I kind of have a my own style is because I don't, uh, I would have to say that my, my, my modern influences or my contemporary influences are at a, at a very low rate compared to what I've taken away from reading people from much farther back, including all the way back to reading a lot of Homer and stuff like that when I was a kid and then trying to modernize it in my fiction. Well, and I don't want to come off set because the, the Repairman Jack series, F. Paul Wilson, is one of my favorites. And, yes. And Paul has a lot of the same influences, but he's he is like a really sweet guy. And I think sometimes that that comes off in the, in, in the books a little bit. And I don't want to come off sounding like, you know, you're hanging out with pirates or whatever. But these books, the Isaiah Coleridge books, feel... Um, dangerous they feel like you're you're hanging out somewhere where it might not be safe to be <laughs> in, 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 in a way that i think is is really good and it shows all those influences the witty and one of the things about crime novels i don't know what it is about crime novels but um the character the, the witty dialogue that comes up even in the the meanest and nastiest crime stories um is so is so much a part of it and I admit that when I first read Blood Standard, I wondered to myself, well, I, I remember thinking, I wonder if Laird is going to be able to be funny enough <laughs> to, to make this dialogue funny. And I was cracking up the whole time and right in all the right places and at the same time, like cringing at some of it. And so I really appreciated that, that vein of humor. Do you, do, do you have any theories of where that comes from in crime fiction or or why it works so well in crime fiction it, it works well I, sorry to interrupt um go ahead no it I, works it, it works in horror too it's the it's the it's the imagine if you're playing a tug of war and i don't know whether you're playing the tug of war just with the narrative itself or with the with the audience it could be either or both but essentially there's tension 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 in 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 crime and thriller and horror and noir you know that, that little group they all they're a Venn diagram and there's this tension and you can you can do something like McCarthy well I mean nobody really can but I mean you could try to do something like McCarthy where it's just tension 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 all the time and you're exhausted um or you can be more like Ligotti uh who actually I have to give a lot of credit to um for being actually quite humorous with like peppered inside all of that dark nihilist you know, kind of worldview that, that he that he propagates, but there's actually there's actually little moments of of incandescent humor, uh, sort of sort of hidden in there, and crime fiction in general. I feel like that's always been kind of laughing in the face of death. I think that's one aspect of it, the gallows humor. Uh, I think the reason that I'm able to do it to whatever degree that I do is because that's. That actually is uh, not necessarily the witty repartee, but the gallows humor is a barren um, trait. trait. I think it's Alaskan trait because right. you either, so many times when I was growing up, uh, the circumstances of my, our lives were so difficult that you either laugh or you cry. Mm -hmm. And so we, we laughed a lot, not always in the face of death, although occasionally, but it was usually in the face of bitter defeat just absolute, just absolute defeat on so many different levels that you just, you, either you would quit, curl into a ball and quit, or you chuckle bitterly mm -hmm. and you move on. And uh, so it comes pretty naturally that, you know, I, I think that's why I also have an affinity for reading that kind of stuff and enjoying it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a tendency to write what you enjoy. Uh, even if it's not directly the same thing, you still, it, infor it informs your, your, your creativity, whether you're an artist whether you're a writer, a singer, whatever, you're going to end up, if you love torch songs, you know, that's probably going to become an aspect of whatever art that you're creating on some, on some level. And I think the dark humor that, you know, that t tension reliever that exists within horror and noir and crime uh, is just something that, uh, I, I, I think it's just something that I've had since I was a little kid, really. 
Yeah, and, and uh, I, I will never un uh, underestimate your ability to humor ever again, after, especially after Blood Standard, but uh, um, <laughs> that, um, there are certain lines in Blood Standard that I dog-eared the page and made sure it got into my review because they made me laugh so much. Um, and uh, so a series was always sort of in your mind um, w with Isaiah, like as it was always... Yes. That you had intended. So. Yes. Um, now I'm not quite certain how many books I've ever had in mind. Initially, I was going to parallel the Hercules, his twelve labors, and but after the first book, I said, "No, nah, that's too, that's too small, it's too, it's too limiting at least for me. I want it. I don't want him to be Hercules, or he's not Achilles. He's, you know, Tain from Maori uh, mythology. Uh, no, he's." He's maybe a like sort of like a like a strange reflection of all those of all those type ar archetypes. Uh, it's it's something that I've been playing with with my writing in general. Uh, as I've told people before, most of my horror and of course the Coleridge series takes place in the same universe. But uh, most of my work occupies uh, two parallel universes. Or there's possibly a third. Well, there actually is a third one, but uh, everything everything kind of takes place in one or the other of of those universes and. Um, you know, I, I just, I just felt like um, it was too small to say, okay, well, Coleridge is just basically, you know, he, 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 this is an allegory about Hercules and, and all this stuff. And I was like, nah, it's, it, it's, it's, it doesn't match up. I don't want it to match up. And that was kind of what I was going to say about my universe is that, that people are always trying to fit those, pu the puzzle pieces together. And I want to play fair and say, yeah, yeah, that, you know, the, you know, things aren't always arbitrary, that there is a lot of intentionality there, but things don't always match up like a puzzle, a perfect puzzle. There's going to be pieces that don't line up properly, because I find that more satisfying than, oh, I've solved this, if you're reading along, I've, I've solved all these little mysteries. I don't want you to solve all the mysteries, and you don't, want, you don't want to solve them either, no matter how much you think you do, but you do want to feel like you're on the right track, and so I try to, to be fair in that regard, that everything does sort of on some level it will mesh but then something over here will be it's like a rubik's cube it's like ah oh, i've got all but one square ah oh, damn it and i gotta keep messing with the whole thing but i'm on the right track and so uh Col coleridge from the very start was um intended to be a series and it went from 12 labors to and i was going to do it over 12 books to probably fewer books than that like seven or to nine books but um not about Hercules. It's just that he's reflective of an archet of the of the masculine macho doomed uh, heroic archetype from ancient from ancient times. Mm -hmm. Well, and and I think you gave some hints up there that I I, I I wondered if this didn't tie to greater works in a in a uh, dark tower or uh, right and Jack kind of way. Yep. But, at the same time, like I was almost, I had, I had written a question about that originally, and then I had, had a, a deleted it because I was like, I don't really want to know uh, at this point because I don't. I think if if I was supposed to know, it'd be there. Um, and I think what you're saying is is that it's not a one plus one equals two kind of thing. No. And, and, well, go ahead. Which, as a fan of Philip K. Dick and somebody who's a scholar of Philip K. Dick. One of the things that people always try to do is paint Philip K. Dick into, um, like for example, with Man in the High Castle, it's like, oh, it's the 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 universe where the Nazis won, or our universe, and it's very clearly like, no, there's there's a spectrum of things, right? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a big part of his. I mean, I'm no scholar like yourself, but I read a lot of Philip K. Dick as a teenager, a lot. My mom had stacks of Philip K. Dick. I Am the Sky is one of uh, the best horror novels ever written, I think. Uh, it should be a movie. But uh, I Am uh, the Sky is a personal favorite of mine. So I just think that, you know, I'm not saying that's his best book. I'm just saying what a great horror story, though, science fiction horror story. But uh, not, not to derail what you're saying, but one thing that a thread that does run through Dick's work, at least to the limited, you know, I probably read like a dozen of his books and a bunch of his stories, uh, is the multiplicity of the universe. The, the idea that there's just, or even within outside of our own universe, even within our own universe, there's honeycomb. It's like a honeycomb, and uh, you could step off the track at any moment, then be back on it again. And it's yeah, I think to try to pigeonhole him would is kind of a fruitless, a fruitless right. and sort of arrogant proposition, really. 
and tying that back to your work, I, I, I got the impression, especially from Worse Angels, mm -hmm. that it would be a fool's errand to view this, this, this expanded consciousness that Isaiah Coleridge is getting in this third book as being uh, something that could in any way be hammered down at this point, <laughs> right? We're, I, I agree. We're just seeing the glimpses of that, and we'll get to that um, when we get more focused on Worse Angels, but, but let's talk about Black Mountain, because I've talked a lot about Blood Standard. The second <laughs> in your series is where, you know, um, it gets uh, quite a bit darker, and um, I think that since a lot of people probably came to your work um, via uh, all the wonderful and nice things that True Detective creator Nick Pizzolatto said about um, your influence on his work and the blurb on Blood Standard, which was was pretty um, timely and awesome thing to, to, to be there. But I think unintentionally, you're on a similar lane with um, Black Mountain because you're getting into the um, the supernatural uh, serial killer thing that's going on in that book. And so it was obviously clearly a choice with Black Mountain to ratchet it up on the supernatural, I take it, right? With Black Mountain? Or, or maybe even more fair to say, or I don't know, fair, but accurate to say um, the super science aspect certainly was ratcheted up, but um, probably both. Um, it's just that what, one thing I, I am trying to do with the series is it's, it's difficult. It's not at all an easy, easy job. Easy job for me would be to either it's supernatural and we just go with that or it's straightforward. You know, there, sometimes there's like the Scooby-Doo thing like, oh, I thought it was a monster, but no, it's a robot or you know, somebody wearing a mask. That's pretty easy to do. What's difficult to pull off, especially since so many people know uh, my other work and they know that this is set in the same universe any plausible deniability for for just run of the run of the mill you know readers who just want to run of the mill crime or, or, or thriller um to have some kind of fig leaf to, to clutch to go well but is there any rational way that any of this could happen and so i've been trying to provide that, that yeah i'm not trying to trick people into thinking it's one thing or another it's more just that coleridge doesn't even know even at the end of worst angels coleridge is not 100 percent convinced of what he that saw. he yeah right i mean we i think we have a good idea that undreamt of miracles or marvels or horrible marvels are occurring but still they're within the realm of the weird things that happen throughout history on our little planet here so that's been very difficult though to to basically go well hypnosis would cover this or there are there are swamis who could do such a thing they could you know lower their resting heart rate to, to basically a comatose state or you know hibernate blah 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 on on there's certain scientific uh you know theories about time slippage or the uh, uh, m-brain theory all you know, that kind of stuff that physics don't always work the way that we think th that the layman thinks that it works but you know it, it's it's very difficult to walk that that tightrope but that's what i that's what i am trying to do well and, and certainly there's there's plenty of people who i mean true detective touched on the mainstream in a way that that the the stuff that Pizzolatto was was influenced by has not reached, and and um, it's a it's a fair thing for writers and readers to want to connect those worlds. Um, you know, I I think writers can give the the fans of True Detective something more, you know, and say like, hey, here's there's a whole wide world <laughs> of fiction out there that that you can go to. And I have loved being able to have this series of books to, for my friends who are a little bit more mainstream, who mm -hmm. say like, oh, I love True Detective. What's something I can read? I love being able to say, well, you should check out these Isaiah Coleridge books. Um, because um, well, they're different, they're not exactly like True Detective, um, I think that they they scratch some of the same itches. You, you know what I mean? And no, and I, that's a, that's the intention of them. The intention is yeah. because I could have just from the very start have written what I've always you know made my bones writing. 
uh, a Pinkerton or a or a C, a, a, an SA spy or a mafioso fallen leg breaker gets involved with cosmic horror. And I could have just done that explicitly and from the very beginning. This is this, this is why this has been difficult because uh, the whole point was to grow my audience, not keep reinforcing exactly what I'd done before. Now, I'm not making any promises because of various commercial uh, realities and where this series will or won't go. Uh, I'm going to be making some changes to, to what I plan on doing. But the first three, uh, and they kind of work as a little, like if I never wrote another one, they kind of work as a little trilogy. Um, were well, designed them a trilogy, whether you like it or not. <laughs> right. I, I actually, I think they work as a trilogy. And until there's another one, they're a trilogy. But yeah. They leave a lot of, you know, dangling threads, but that's, you know, even, even if I had never planned to write another one, I would have left dangling threads left and right. But they've always been, and they will continue to be, designed to throw something out there for people who don't want to read my horror fiction. Uh, and so I give them something else to, to, to hold on to, at least with these first three. And that was the plan from the start. And I, I, I pride myself in thinking that I did, a, you know, that I did that, that I, that I delivered on, you know, uh, we can argue about quality, but I, but I do believe that they're, you know, that they are crime thriller. You know, they're, they're kind of a mix of, of mainstream genres and the horror is a secondary or a tertiary aspect of them. Yeah, and, and, and I, um, you know, I, look, I, as a writer, I, I certainly um, understand and wanting and, and think it's great when writers want to grow their audience and, and, and move to bigger territories. And, you know, um, and certainly we've seen some really cool successes within the horror genre recently with uh, Jeremy Robert Johnson, like getting mainstream success, and, but especially Sarah Pimborough, um, who's writing these um, crazy, like, um, domestic and, like, marriage thrillers, but uh, Dead to Her, the most recent one that Pimborough wrote was great. Um, it's a marriage thriller, but it has, like, all kinds of like crazy awesome feminist themes mixed into it. Right. And, like for her to get to a new audience is great because then I hope they'll go back and read A Matter of Blood and see that she wrote a dystopia with a serial killer who's as gruesome and as fucked up as anything I've read anywhere. Right. Well, that's, that's a really good point. Um, you know, and she also writes really great short fiction. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I, you know, no matter what happens with my commercial career, I have my uh, pretty successful short short fiction collection. I mean, I've been able to eke out a living just with short fiction for years, and so which is pretty rare. Uh, and you know, uh, it could always be better. But what that allows me to do, though, is to do things that I want to do as an artist with impunity with short fiction. I have some place to sell them. I could I could publish them myself if people decided they didn't want to public take chances on them. But you're allowed to take risks in short fiction because the stakes are much lower. And so I can I can exercise that part of my I can exercise the demons on my back that want me to write this opaque uh, experimental stuff that, that, to prove to myself, yeah, you can do this. That's part of the reason that I write. I want to constantly make a lift, you know, to use lifting terminology, to make a lift that I couldn't make a couple of years ago. I want to be able to put five more pounds on that on that deadlift and, and, and stand up with it. It may not mean anything to anyone else, but it means something to me. At mm -hmm. the same time, I need to make a living. And uh, that's what something like Coleridge sort of straddles that. It's it's a little too weird to be to be fully mainstream. I I really should commit more to the mainstream, but it's definitely far more, you know, mainstream than any of my, uh, you know, like my Jessica Mace, that's my other, I, won't, I hate to use the word franchise character, but let's just say a, rec a, a recurring point of view character. I was looking at, you know, I've written about five or six stories that directly involve her. And I was looking at one the other day because I'm getting ready to put together, you know, my fifth collection. I'm gonna hopefully have it uh, ready to go to send out next year. And so I'm reading some of her stuff and going, yeah, this is not, you know, this would not, no editor at Putnam or any of those, you know, any of the big five would be interested in this. Um, this would be definitely, you know, uh, a small press that, 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 that indulges this kind of crazy stuff because the, how the, even though, and there, and that's another example of the tough guy in this case, the tough gal, you know, she's this more hard bitten character and yet she, she could not, and also in the first person, but how I tell, how her story narratively unfolds is so different 
and her tactics are so different. And even how she thinks about the universe is so different from uh, Isaiah that it just, you know, it, it makes me happy that I can kind of have a foot in both worlds, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, right. And, and, um, and, and I do like that you are keeping a foot in both worlds. Uh, Sarah's completely committed, for example, to the, <laughs> to the uh, path that she's taking. And, and, and look, I, lo I like her thriller works. I think they're great. Um, I prefer her horror stuff. Whereas the opposite is the case with, um, I think with your work is that um, the, the, these three books are, are my favorite Laird Baron works that I've read. Um, oh, I'm sorry, hold on. So, All right, sorry folks about the uh, dog barking. Uh, I believe that is taken care of. Um, but yeah, so for me, it's funny because um, even if this is an attempt to be more mainstream that the, these three books are the ones that speak to me um in, in a way and and i know i the analogy i use and i was just torturing the analogies in the worst angels review but it, to me like the book three is where the 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 piece of peanut butter that has or the piece of sandwich that has the peanut butter and the piece that has the jelly come together <laughs> um because we've got excellent crime stuff we've got political stuff and worse angels and we have like the kind of crazy science fiction and cosmic thing going on and all mm. these elements are, are coming together and that's one of the reasons why i think it makes a great finale and i don't want to give away too much because i i, I i'm sure there are some people that are listening that haven't read it yet but um worse angels um just give me a non-spoiler take on what you were trying to do with this closing book to give people a feel of, of what they have to look forward to if they're just starting the series, for example. Oh, uh, the idea was to open, was to open the, the world a little wider, you know, and blood standard, it's a very traditional narrative and it's very insular. It just takes place in a small area and it's a very straightforward situation. It's a, you know, a ticking clock. Uh, as you said, Bl Black Mountain, the world opened up a bit and it got weirder uh, and super science and, and kind of Thomas Harris, uh, Silence the Lamb, you know, Red Dragon style horror sort of crept in there. Uh, and we also were introduced with some corporations that are uh, semi-antagonist. Worse, Worse Angels just op broadens the scope or, 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 or widens the keyhole just a little more. And essentially it's, it's still a thriller. It's, it's still a crime novel or a, a kind of a hard bitten mystery, but it, it adds a little more like Col Coleridge is, he realizes that he's in deeper uh, and in more ways than one than he had assumed in the past. His, his problems, his problems uh, encompass a lot more than just his personal well being from case to case. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and the political nature with that, the, the, by this point, he's become a private detective and, and he's working a case where he's been hired by somebody who used to be a security for um, a senator, a very well-to-do, very politically connected family. There's also um, the particle collider is a huge part of the story or the construction of it. Um, and which leads to the incredible set piece when Isaiah has to go underground and one of the great action scenes of, of the whole trilogy act, um, happens down there. And um, the stakes are definitely getting bigger. And I think that um, you've done a really good job over the three books of, of um, having heavy stakes in each one, but uh, creating something that's, that, that definitely feels like it's building the whole time to one end. Um, at that same time, like, I feel it, you know, like you said, it could stand alone as a trilogy, it could end there, but, but there's definitely um, material for, for, for more. Um, how far ahead have you thought with Isaiah Coleridge in the future? Uh, to the end. I know what happens to him. Uh, I know why. I just don't know. And I, and, and, and the reason I don't know is because I, I like to leave some of the pleasure of discovery for myself, but, and, and also as, as I grow to normal, you know, here's the thing, those three novels, they, they average around 80, 80 to 85,000 words a piece. So you're talking over a quarter of a million words 
with the, with those three novels. I've never spent, you know, th th I've never spent that amount of time with a character and actually several characters, you know, you've got Lionel and Megara and a few other, uh, Bello and a few others. Uh, that's a lot of words. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot of words for me to be with one character. I've always just had recurring, uh, you know, uh, small, you know, like Jessica Mace. Yeah, that, I've written like six stories, but that's like a quarter of that. It's like 60, 70,000 words about Jessica Mace at the most. And then after that, it's just like, ah, I wrote a story about a guy and maybe you hear about him in another story, but that's it. There's never, I've never re repeated characters as POV characters. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I'm, I'm not too concerned about how I get, I know what the destination is, but I'm not that concerned about how I get there is because I know more about Coleridge now and less uh, than I did when I started. I know more about the important, like how he'll react to situations, what his what his thoughts on you know important matters are, especially mechanistically, like how I move him around and a you know how is he going to get from place to place? How is he going to react to certain threats, etc.? What's his morality seem to be? But I also know less in the sense that there's a lot more to him to be to be revealed. I, I've never I've never bought into the idea that. To be successful, a story requires a character to change. Um, I think that's actually a fallacy. I think it's fine if they do. I think there's tons of examples, good and bad, where characters don't change. I think you could probably point out, well, this is not a very good story, and here's one of the reasons why. But I think a good story is a good story, and a good story does not require a character arc in the traditional sense. What may be required, is, now, over a longer period, you know, like say we're talking about a, a story that takes place over the course of a novel, uh, is revelation. In other words, the character may be almost identical to where he or she began, but you're not. You know something about them that you didn't know uh, at, the, at the beginning. So they may, they may still be just plodding along, doing what they would have done from page one, but you had no idea. You, 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 you know, and it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be even dramatic. But, so I feel like with Coleridge, he is changing to some degree. That that does seem to be occurring, but I'm my pleasure in writing about him is discovering more things about him. And I realize that, like any real, you know, he's becoming real in my mind. Like any real person, uh, there's a lot. You know, some people to more, some, one degree or another uh, contain multitudes, as Whitman says, and, and Coleridge contains multitudes. And I could, you know, could write a hundred books about him and still not have uncovered every little detail uh so i'll stick with the seven or ten or whatever it's going to be but as i write these stories he surprises me uh how he well, as he learns see here's the thing is he's starting to run into things he never ran into before and so i get to be surprised by how he and lionel for example react to the mares of thrace or what was going on down under the super in the super collider and kind of some of the implications with what the rich people are up to you know they never thought about stuff like that before, or at least not, uh, it wasn't really a conscious thing with them. Now they're thinking about it. That is gonna be interesting for me to explore and to discover how they, how that shapes their strategies going, going forward or, or, and their philosophy. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, and it's funny too, because you, I was a, about to disagree with you and then you, uh, <laughs> to further your point, which is um, I think, I want to highlight is the idea that I really like what you said about um, if, if the character doesn't have an arc, it's fine as long as the reader has an arc <laughs> at the same time or, or the person that the story is being told to is, is a good um, parallel to that because I think one of the times or one of the things that a lot of stories are missing is, is if they don't have an arc for, for you to experience through the eyes of the character you should at least be going through a journey. And um, I, I, I really, well, and, and in relation to these books, I see what you're saying as far as, as Coleridge is, he, he hasn't changed too much. I think he, he has a little bit more of a relationship with the, with the girlfriend and, and, and the kid than I expected in the beginning. <laughs> uh, but um, we as the reader are, 
definitely going on a journey with these books and it's cool to know that you know where it's going to end and unlike f paul wilson thankfully you haven't already written and published the ending before having to do a bunch of books because <laughs> he did oh, that the backfill the backfill yeah yeah he did that with night world he wrote the end to the repairman jack like years before he started the series and uh, had to write to it and um and thankfully well i like i love hearing that you said seven or ten maybe so hopefully we'll we'll get that many isaiah coleridge books because uh um, i'm here for it and uh um each time you release one i'm sure i'll twist more terrible analogies and similes to explain my reading experience so yeah, it's, um, oh, go ahead sorry <laughs> Um, but, uh, anything else you want to say about this series or give, give a pitch before, and I have one other thing that I want to ask you at the end here, but, um, you know, Isaiah Coleridge, like for new readers who, you know, are totally, totally, maybe they're a crime reader, but they've, they were, you know, they've never read any, they've never read any of your work before. What, how do you, What's the pitch you give for Isaiah Coleridge? Where do you start with? The, uh, the, the high concept pitch just for, for Coleridge is actually was one of the a great compliment that a reviewer for, um, I want to say, Associated Press gave me. And he, he or it might even been actually uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they compared Coleridge. They said essentially Coleridge is like if um, Sanders uh, meets Bram Stoker. And I thought that was that was pretty, that was about Black Mountain. And so I really like that. Um, you know, he's, and, and I think, you know, I haven't read a lot of Jack Reacher. There's a lot of comparison to Jack Reacher. He's, he's much more flawed than, uh, and I think a lot grittier, uh, not as a character, but just like the setting is a lot grittier, you know, uh, you're not always convinced things are going to turn out all right for, for Coleridge and his, and his pals and uh, probably, probably aren't actually. Considering well, what I understand about the Jack Reacher books is he's a lot more flawed than than what we saw on screen for sure. Oh yeah, and he's also not five foot eight and Tom Cruise. It's just though that <laughs> right. So they're, we're definitely they're, they're, uh, not Tom Cruise playing Isaiah Coleridge. But but uh, Isaiah no, no. Uh, <laughs> Isaiah though isn't um, you know I, I think I think it's a fair comparison to, to when you start talking about Spencer and and Reacher and Marlowe and people in, in, in some in some degree because he occupies that uh, on the surface that tarnished night but I but I do think there's a mythic quality to him that is and and, and the flaws that come with the mythology they're not the kind of I'm trying to avoid the flaws that are just are, are, are convenient flaws like he broods a lot no bad things are, are you just I just need more time to write more about him but bad things continually happen to him and they get worse because you you know uh, he's a leopard that can't change his spots i mean there's there's just he, even even if he even if he does change the stuff that he's done in the past is never going to let you know doesn't seem to ever let go of him it seems to be it mutates into something worse and worse so there's a there's a for me there's a i'm i'm in love with the tr with the shakespearean and the greek tragedy with the samurai tragedy i bring up matter of fact coleridge is a huge fan of this he, he and lionel are big fans of the samurai epic as as i am and john lang and uh, i used to go over to john langan's house and marathon those but part of the reason that i that, that i like them and uh by extent he he likes them is is that there's this uh is is the tragic element uh of Lone Wolf and Cub or the Kurosawa epics or what, what have you. I, I really, really do, do, do have a great fondness for that. Um, th that's missing, I think, from one of my favorite genres, the Western. The Western has a sort kind of a soft version of it. Oh, he doesn't get the girl, he rides off, but he still has his horse. Uh, there, there's a loneliness to it, but that's ex exacerbated in the, old, in the old classics, the old mythology. Mythology is just some of the saddest heroic and the thing i like about it it kind of typifies everything that i've ever that i've ever been as a horror writer mm -hmm. sure uh, i i don't write about uh mealy mouth little at you know little self-effacing academic going up against the darkness i go no it's a marine corps veteran you know with a silver star it's a it's a it's a spy it's a it's an arm breaker for the mafia who has an army behind him etc and so forth none of that matters none of us can beat death none of us are immune from tragedy and I, I really think mythology um, 
is is where you know I read a lot of mythology as a kid, and I think that really imprinted itself upon me. And um, th that tragic melancholy aspect of Coleridge's existence is what I'm here for. Well, and I will say that I, I don't remember which of the, I, it was either Black Mountain or Blood Standard, but at one point in one of the reviews that I had been writing, I erased a sentence where I, I said, um, I can't remember exactly how I said it, but I basically, I made a, an analogy that Coleridge is uh, definitely a character whose favorite movies are probably High Plains Drifter or Yajimbo. <laughs> And, and, then, yes. and I was like, I don't think most of the people reading this review are going to understand the Yajimbo reference. So I just took it out. And um, <laughs> that's so <laughs> true, though. So true. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, that's a feeling that, that you should know that I got off of, off of reading this is that that, that, that whole um, Lone Samurai or the, the, the lost... Um, thing uh, is something that that I thought of because and, and and I was talking to my writing partner Anthony Trevino at one point about the the Isaiah Coleridge books and I he said he just wanted a point of reference and he said who do you think would would play Coleridge in a movie and I said well I'd want uh Mifuni, but I, I can't see it happening but uh just in oh, my I love like you know well, I think I'm, I'm oh sorry I was just no go ahead all I was going to say is that uh, uh, Yojimbo is awesome. That was one of the movies that I actually, first time I ever, I probably watched it when I was a kid, but I, but I consciously watched it a few years ago for the first time with Langan during our, our big uh, samurai, you know, and actually it wasn't just samurai, it was Yakuza, uh, mystery, you know, Japanese, you know, thrillers, Korean thrillers, things like that. But um, Throne of Blood, I, I mentioned that in... Um, Worst Angels as he's talking, he, he, each of the books he mentions something, you know, he, he, he or Lionel will say something about, about pop culture, Conan the Barbarian or, or Yojimbo or somebody, you know, we'll get mentioned, Lone Wolf or something will get mentioned. But in the third one he did, he said he, that he, he expects to go out, something to the effect of he'll probably go out like, you know, uh, at the end of Throne of Blood, you know, Mifune did staggering around getting pin cushioned by his people, curse, cursing them. Because that's the th that's the tragedy. It doesn't matter how big a badass you are and how many people you're you're sore. You could have a three body blade and you could cut down a hundred men. The hundred first guy is going to get you, or the hundred and second, or the hundred and twentieth. But you're you know you are a man, and uh, you might be a Superman, but you're a man. And I that's been at the heart of almost all my fiction, is mm -hmm. that we're, we're it's not just a man, you know, a woman, whatever. You know, we're human, and we're we're fragile, no matter how tough we may seem to be. Well, and that's the thing is that, that with, with these, um, these books, like they, they bleed in a, in a, in a way like, you know, like a peck and paw move. Oh, they, 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 yeah. they, they have that, that Kurosawa thickness and, 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 and that's, that's, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about them. So to, to close things up, um, I, I wonder. Um, uh, so one of the things that's that's that, that's nice about these books is, and and one of the things that makes me just really gravitate towards them is that I don't feel they they are exactly like anything else, right? Like, um, and one of the things that you know over the last three years that I've had one to look forward to every year has been very very exciting for me because I'm like, oh, like, I know I'm going to get this feeling and this energy. And um, <laughs> I don't know how to say this where it's not going to come off sounding wrong that some people are going to be offended by this. But if you, you know, as somebody who's searching for an agent for my current work in progress, and I read what the agents are looking for out there right now, it's more diversity, more, you know, um, you know, high literature or whatever the, the, getting a highly literate tough guy <laughs> machismo book <laughs> um is something that i am super excited about it's a voice that it's a niche that i think um as somebody who grew up on samurai movies and kung fu movies like john woo movies i am loving this I'm, I'm loving that, that feeling, that atmosphere. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. 
That being said, um, I know you're still kind of working in the short story field and the cosmic horror field, and that's kind of, you know, where you came from. Either crime or horror, is there anybody out there right now that you just, that is just really um, somebody that you think, somebody else you want to point to that we should be reading? Thank Uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's, that's a really important question. And I think it's, I I always, if I get a chance, I like to talk about briefly about somebody who's doing something. Um, And and I normally, I talk about, I'm really good friends with Langan, John Langan, and a lot of people I'm sure are going to be familiar with him, Paul Tremblay, Stephen Graham Jones. I've talked about them, Livy Llewellyn. I talk about them all the time, but I'll just mention um, a couple people. And I don't, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, if, if your crowd has read them, but Donald Ray Pollock, uh, he wrote Devil All the Time. It's be, it's being made to a Netflix movie, or, or I, I'm not sure if it's a movie or a series. It could be a limited run, but it's it's coming out on Netflix soon. Genius short fiction writer, genius uh, cr- crime noir author, and he 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 doesn't go in the same direction I do. But I would say, especially like Devil All the Time, there's there's definitely a horror, there's definitely a horror component to it. But but he's a hardcore you know noir guy. And all of its backwoods kind of thing. And people have compared him to McCarthy too. I mean, there's like the elements of his brutality in some of the stories are, or the visceral violence uh, is really good. And uh, another author that I would uh, say is really good is J. Todd Scott. He's got a book out, uh, or coming out very soon. Or actually just came out. Anyway, he wrote The, uh, uh, the High White Empty. Um, uh, he writes about uh, a deputy sheriff called Cherry. And he reminds me a lot of um, uh, McCarthy mixed with I don't know Lee, you know uh, Burke, you know guys, you know guys like that. Um, really, just a beautiful, a beautiful um, stylist. And a matter of fact, before I let me just see if I can, because uh, I I should have his uh, book. It's coming out. I haven't had a chance to read it. Uh, Jay Todd Scott. Do, do, do. The Lost, or Lost River. Yeah, High White Sun. I'm sorry, it was The Far Empty and, and High White Sun. Uh, I actually didn't start with the, with, the first, with the first one. I started with um, the second one. But yeah, Lost River, which is, I, I guess, takes it into different, it's set in a different part of the country. The other ones were Southwest stories. But those are two people, uh, the authors that I highly recommend that, that are writing, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, I could actually see Scott writing writing horror. I guess I guess he's tried his hand at it in the past, but he's just doing he's doing so well with with these kind of thriller uh, mystery you know, noir novels of his that kind of they sort of they sort of straddle multiple multiple genres. But um, very very much recommended to anybody who likes if you like my stuff, go read these guys because uh, they're they're super good. Mm. Oh, that's great. Well, Laird, uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, it's really fun for me to talk about these books. Um, and I managed to do it with, I think, staying pretty spoiler-free. Uh, <laughs> that I, hope, think so. I think yeah, so. Yeah, I, I, I hope. Um, um, and, and then one of the other things that I want people to to get a feel for is just the, the type of the energy that these books give me. Um, I, I, I really think that they're worth people's time and and if 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 i can compare it to anything and saying that it gives me a yajimbo peck and paw feel um i can't believe i've never made those comparisons in any of the reviews that i've written but uh um there that it's it's clearly there and it's something that um the the crime fiction world has needed and to get it from somebody who's so well versed in horror fiction just um perfect uh, thank you so much i appreciate it i appreciate it all right uh laird thanks for joining us on postcards from a dying world and for the first official interview as a podcast um all the old interviews oh. were ones that i was just testing the waters although you got pretty good company with brian evanson and and Cody Goodfellow and Jeremy Robert Johnson already. So uh, you're, you're talking about some of the best authors working. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I've been. I, I know uh, Cody did a crime novel with Repo Shark, but it was still super weird. I would love to see that dude write a straight up crime novel. Um, so I'm just gonna put that out there in the universe. 
Um, <laughs> Cause I want to too. Me too. Yeah. All right, Laird, it was great talking to you and we'll talk to you probably when book four comes out. Well, thank you for having me on.